Oil exports had again become targets, this time in the tanker war. Iran's main oil loading facility at Hog Island was repeatedly attacked, as were ships carrying their oil. A fourth front now, opened also by Iraq, takes place in the Persian Gulf, a place where Iraq has no presence, but they do have anti-ship missiles mounted to fighter bombers. And they can attack the Iranian Navy and, more importantly, the Iranian oil stations and the tankers which carry not only Iranian oil, but the entire regions for oil, including Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. It's a desperation move here, the so-called tanker war, a move to involve the superpowers who, according to Saddam Hussein's logic, would hopefully broker some type of a peace settlement, much as had happened during the Suez Crisis of 1956. Foreign tankers now had to steer a careful route to avoid Iranian territorial waters. But Iran retaliated from remote Gulf bases, using speedboats armed with rocket launchers to attack ships suspected of carrying Iraqi oil. That action brought in the superpower. In the opening months of the tanker war, some 70 ships were hit, first by Iraqi jets aiming to endanger oil shipping sufficiently to draw in the superpowers. Then, as now, oil supplies were considered a vital Western interest, which became threatened because Iran had no similar targets. Iraqi ships had been stranded either by fighting or by Iran's naval blockade. Iran had a superior navy using British Gulf frigates to stop and inspect any shipping thought to be trading with Iraq. They operated with virtual impunity, largely because Iraqi pilots had no training in hitting naval targets. Some attacks suspected tankers would see launch missiles. Others used their radar to bring in missile attacks from land bases. In the first year alone, 1984, attacks came at the rate of two a week with Iraq hitting three times as many as Iran. As tanker after tanker came under attack, the Kuwaitis, who felt most vulnerable, hit on a scheme to gain superpower protection. This involved getting ships re-flagged, that means re-registered in the name of a country like the United States, whose warships would then be allowed by international law to intervene in the event of any attack. The aim of the Iraqis would thus be achieved by a non-combatant as increasing numbers of tankers trading from neutral ports were attacked. Some were the victims of air-launched Exocet missiles. Eventually, the United States President Ronald Reagan announced action to protect oil shipping in the Gulf. Let there be no misunderstanding. We will accept our responsibility for these vessels in the face of threats by Iran or anyone else. If we fail to do so, simply because these ships previously threw the flag of another country, Kuwait, we would advocate our role as a naval power. And we would open opportunities for the Soviets to move into this choke point of the free world oil flow. In a word, if we don't do the job, the Soviets will. In fact, Soviet warships were already in the Gulf and as America hesitated, they leased the Kuwaitis three tankers, affording Soviet protection in the tank. Even more than Western powers, the Soviets faced a sharply growing dependency on Gulf oil. But the United States quickly followed suit to protect Western oil interests, not for the first time and not for the last. As tankers queued up for protection, the United States gave new identities to 11 Kuwaiti ships half of Kuwait's super tanker fleet. To gain the protection of American warships, they took down their Kuwaiti flags and changed their names. The first, the al was renamed Bridgeton. Capable of carrying half of Kuwait's entire daily oil production, her re-registration was a turning point signaling that Iran would not be allowed to win this war. The aircraft carrier USS Constellation, with its A-7 Crusaders and F-14 Tomcats, led a substantial part of the American 6th Fleet in protection duties. The British played a similar role, as oil shipment now fell to convoys in a manner reminiscent of the Second World War. 
Iraq, which had no active navy, had succeeded in forcing its ally Kuwait into persuading others to keep the Iranian navy at bay and ensure safe passage for its supplies. They were moves that ultimately made the Gulf less safe, however, by prompting the Iranians to mine international waterways. Submersible television cameras searched for deeply laid mines, while helicopters hunted any on the surface. This was a role in which the Royal Navy specialized. Capture of the Iran Adger was offered as final proof that Iran had been mining the Gulf seaways. Rows of mines on her deck as a evidence. After making the maximum publicity, the Americans sank the boat and repatriated its crew. But the presence of modern Western naval power did not prevent Iranian frigates from checking the identities of tankers in the convoys. Far from deterring the Iranians, American and British presence provoked them into testing Western determination and confrontation increased. Iranian warships and U.S. warships, I-9 rigs. Your active gun mounts just point into my direction. Do not do that again. Over. The Iranians played the same game. U.S. Navy ships disappeared in warships. If you hear me, it seems to me that your helicopter is unable to hear me on guard frequency 243. Advise him not to close to me less than five miles. Over. By now, the very tankers the warships went to protect were themselves protecting their escorts by stealing in front to act as mine shields. No bigger a contradiction, perhaps, than America's reaction to the Iraqi Hexaset missile attack on the frigate USS Scott, killing 37 crew. The Americans blamed the close proximity of a shadowing Iranian gunboat and, far from retaliating, accepted Iraq's apology and redoubled efforts to prevent Iran intercepting Western oil supplies. Tit-for-tat attacks on oil installations followed. The Sea Island City Terminal, 10 miles off the Kuwaiti coastline, was hit by Iranian missiles. Its temporary disabling was retaliation for a United States attack on Iran's Rashidat rig which was not just an oil installation, but acted as a base for Iranian speedboats. These were crucial weapons in the Iranian armory, used so effectively in their marshland offensives. Tragedy followed their attack on the American cruiser Vincent. Incoming boats spotted on radar. Almost simultaneously, another apparent attack is identified. Its sun missile is fired, unknowingly not at a warplane, but at passenger jets. Two hundred and ninety civilians died, and with them, Iran's hopes of victory. Its leaders now believing the superpowers would stop at nothing to prevent Iraq losing. <laughs>